The guest that I'd like to invite up on stage is uh, Bei Yang. Bei is a WDI, WDI Technology Studio Executive um, from Walt Disney Imagineering. Um, he's worked with Industrial Light and Magic as well as Lucas Films on an um, innovative attraction, uh, Star Wars themed attraction for Disneyland and Disney World. Um, he's also worked at Goofy's uh, Paint and Playhouse in uh, Tokyo Disneyland and was also the overall control lead for Shanghai Disneyland. Prior to being an Imagineer, he was um, he was working as a visual effects programmer at Shell Games. So welcome, Bay. All right, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, for the record, I did play a lot of video games during summer. <laughs> and I, I, guess, I guess it kind of turned into a job. So, <laughs> um, so thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bay Yang. Uh, so if I were to just say, if you're going to leave with just one thing today, when you're thinking about AR and VR, I think right now when it's kind of a buzzy word, everybody just always assume, oh my gosh, headsets, or oh my gosh, my phone. But really, it's just, it's just a technology. And that's the one thing, if you're going to get out of this, it's not just headsets. Think about it in terms of an immersive tool that we can all use. Imagineering is really responsible for the overall creation, implementation, and design of all of our theme parks and theme park properties all around the world for Walt Disney. Uh, so this includes our cruise ships, this includes our theme parks, and our hotels. So what does that have to do with virtual reality? Well, some people could say that the immersive experience that Disneyland and Disney parks provide is one of the original virtual realities because it's all about immersion. And in fact, one of the things that people always ask me is, what is VR? What is AR? And I always you know, was like, well, what do you think it is? So the answers that I normally get back is like, well, augmented reality. It's like Snapchat filters, or Facebook filters, or Pokemon Go. And when I ask them about virtual reality, it's usually something along the lines of uh, the Oculus Rift, or the HTC Vive, or the PlayStation VR, right? These are things that are in, uh, that are in consumer electronics today. But what I really think is, uh, is really fascinating is that VR is really us living in the future. I mean, I think the theme that every single speaker today has talked about is the fact we are in the future. Like, we actually have flying cars right now. People are working on flying cars. There's like people going into space. We're able to go into these fantastical worlds just by putting these like very consumer-ready headsets onto our heads. There's robots and drones flying around. There's high school kids developing full robots in 30 days. I mean, we are in the future, and VR is just one of those components. But of course, VR has also been around for a while. In fact, it's been talked of as the future for a while. This is a photo from 1989. So surely that is when VR was invented. This is actually a photo from 1968. And just so you don't know, 1968, that's when Yale first started to announce, not the year that it did, but the year that it announced that it was going to accept women. Uh, that's the year that Nixon got elected as president. And also, you know, the Vietnam War was happening. So this is a picture of the sort of uh, Damocles. Uh, which, was a, uh, which was a graduate school project by a guy named I Ivan Sutherland, which many consider, including myself, as the father of computer graphics. And he wrote a treatise in 1965 about the ultimate computer display that is often quoted in virtual reality. Uh, the ultimate display would be in a room uh, in which the computer can control the existence of matter, a chair would uh, in such a room would be good enough to sit in, handcuffs displayed in such a room would be confining, and a bullet displayed in such a room would be fatal. Maybe we don't want that fatal part, but ultimately uh, what he's talking about is, of course, uh, immersion. So in VR, uh, what we have is this trend towards immersion. So towards the left side are maybe things that are not as immersive, like your traditional film and television, although when film and television was first invented, it was considered extremely immersive. So as you trend towards more and more immersion, you get VR. So the way that I like to think about it is really VR and getting immersion is all about your body's input and output. So what do I mean by that? Your body's input, right? These are the things inside going into your brain, and these are your senses. This is your sense of touch, taste. 
But then you also have output. And our output are things that, like our speech, things that we move with our bodies, right? We can draw. Uh, we can have a thought in our mind and make a picture on a page. Uh, we can have a poem and we can talk about those things. But VR and this level of immersion is all about spoofing the amounts of inputs that's going into your body to really kind of trick your brain into thinking that you are in a place that you are not. So VR is really about faking your body's I.O. And in this case, many of the headsets today are much more about faking your visual system. And specifically, the two things that we always look at today are the two major ones which is your field of view and motion parallax. So I'm going to talk about these two things, which is some of the fundamental components about understanding the cognitive psychology points of immersion and VR. So the first part is, of course, field of view. So field of view is basically to say that the human vision has a particular field of view. We have the most resolution on the center, but we can actually see far more than that. And having things on the side envelop this field of view is one of the key contributing factors to your own feeling of immersion. So everything actually has a field of view. In fact, when you watch a television, it happens to have a fairly low field of view. But what's interesting about that is, depending on how close you sit to the television, you have a different field of view. I mean, this is simple trigonometry. If I move closer to the television, I have a higher field of view. And if I were to move closer still, or I'm just strapping a display to my face, Welcome to modern VR. And that's exactly what the Google Cardboard is. In fact, the Google Cardboard actually does not hide it. It's a piece of cardboard that you stick your phone in, and then there's two magnifying glasses that just basically allow for the optics so that you can actually focus on the screen. OK, so very simple concept. We've actually had this concept for a while. I think many of us remember those like red little view masters that you can kind of click through. That was immersive. That had a large field of view. So what's different about today's VR versus those view masters? And the big answer is that today's VR takes into account motion parallax. And motion parallax is one of the uh, main cues that we use for immersion. So motion parallax is basically saying, as we move, our brain interprets the way that images change to get a sense of depth and to get a sense of scale. So one of the key components inside the HTC Vive is not the nice headgear. I mean, that's really just the Viewmaster with a phone in it instead of film. It's these little black boxes. These little black boxes track where your head is at every single position and changes what's being drawn at every single time. So VR today, really, if you think about it, even though we live in the future, is a phone, which is very futuristic, a magnifying glass, which is decidedly not, and a tracker, which is also futuristic, but has been around since uh, the early 90s in terms of movie making. Now, going back into motion parallax, this is one of the most important things to understand, because motion parallax is really about perspective corrected images. To really get that sense of motion parallax, this is really about having an image that is rendered for your specific point of view. I think many people have seen chalk drawings uh, like this. Uh, out there in which you view it from one particular angle and it kind of looks like a distorted mess. But if you have the right position, you can actually get an image out of this and you can perceive depth. Now, what's interesting about this is, remember that little head tracker? We have that head tracker, so that means we can draw an image every fraction of a second to be perfectly correct for where your head is, which is what traditional uh, traditional moving eye point effects are. And in fact, the Amazon Fire Phone actually had this. It used the two front facing cameras to detect where your face is. And as you move the camera, can give you a sense of depth on the screen by doing a perspective correct drawing for every angle that you can hold it at. So what's interesting about this is that means you can have, with a tracker and a flat screen, it doesn't have to be strapped to your face. You can have any perspective correct imagery drawn, which means you don't necessarily need a headset to have an immersive experience. So that means I can, with head tracking, have your television, just like this phone, give you a sense of depth. So the main problem with the television, though, is if I'm sitting really far back, my field of view is kind of terrible. So what do we do? You can add more screens. You add more screens, and eventually you're surrounded by screens, which is the basis for many of our immersive attractions inside the park. 
Uh, so for those of you guys have, that are living in California, if you've ever been to uh, Soren, uh, that is a very large screen that uses uh, perspective correct rendering. But what's really interesting is actually a ride that we developed uh, not so long ago called Ratatouille in Disneyland Paris, uh, in which you ride around on a ride vehicle. So instead of tracking your head, we know exactly where the ride vehicle is. And we can draw the imagery perfectly for where those ride vehicles are. And this allows you uh, this allows us to immerse all of our guests inside the world of Ratatouille. Now, it doesn't just end there. We also can use VR not only as a guest experience, but for work as well. Now, VR has been kind of a hot thing for the last three years. And I got to say, when it became a hot thing, I was like, wait, I thought I was the only person doing this. Uh, because back in around 2005, 2006, which is about when I started in this, we were thinking about how can we possibly use VR at work. Because we make all of these immersive experiences, we want to be able to visualize and to put our designers into those experiences before concrete is being poured. It turns out changing bits is a lot faster than changing concrete and atoms. So we developed the digital immersive showroom, as you see here, which is a 360 degree projection space with head tracking, with high resolution projector that is essentially a VR experience, very high quality VR experience for one person. So that's about VR. Now, what about AR? So going back to this, uh, this little graph that I have here, AR is really just about this uh, plus some amount of the real world. And in fact, if you have full immersion and only real world, you just have the real world. <laughs> so AR is really just every step below that, right? And in that respect, AR is a superset of VR. So that's to say, if I have AR and I keep putting more fake things such that the entire real world just disappears, you just end up with VR. When people talk about AR today, it's either Snapchat filters or it's mobile-based uh, mobile AR such as these. But you can really kind of go beyond this as well, right? There's the headsets that we know today. So Magic Leap released this, this video of hey, in the office of tomorrow, I can just use these AR glasses. Now, what's incredible about this, if you really think about it, there's no more monitors. There's no more displays. This display, it's not here. Your phone, it's just going to go back to a physical keyboard, because physical keyboards are awesome. And you're just going to have screens all around your phone, because you don't need the phone to be a screen anymore. So AR is really kind of waiting on the fact that, oh, right now VR is this basically this phone with, with, with a magnifying glass. What is the magical device right now optically, that we can actually get to a point where we can have very lightweight AR systems. And just like my example with the headsets and mapping that to projectors at, uh, at our theme parks, we also have AR-like experience inside our theme parks as well. So this is Goofy's Paint and Flay from Tokyo Disney, uh, which is Goofy's house. And Goofy's house is done with physical objects. And we use projection to augment the color and the texture of those things and then allow our guests to repaint and redecorate Goofy's home. Uh, so this is a form of projection AR uh, that we use in our parks today. So what's really crazy about this, right, is we have these designs and we have these technologies, but then they can also map to the tools and vice versa. Technology that was developed for the dish goes directly into the technology that was being used for Goofy's Paint and Playhouse. And really, when I say we live in the future, I really do mean we live in the future. This digital immersive showroom that we built was for our designers, for our very large scale theme park attractions, right? This was something that just a few years ago, companies like Disney could do, large enterprises can do. Today, Every student, every person can visualize these attractions. And because we live in the future, don't overthink things, right? So one, one message to you is we live in the future. You can prototype things. There is software out there, and the tools today are just so good that if you have an experience, that if you have a model, if you have anything, you can just try it out. So when people ask me, they're like, oh my god, like, what can I learn? What can I do? I really just tell them, just don't overthink it. Go try it out. The software tools are there. The tools are there. Just go do it. Now, the one thing that I'm going to end, end you guys on is kind of also one important thing that I learned in life. 
uh, in addition to not overthinking it, which uh, started in school today. So I realize that Carnegie Mellon is here. So this story starts at Carnegie Mellon. So big shout out to Carnegie Mellon University. I had a plan when I went to school, and this was undergrad. Uh, I was going to go into information systems. Then I was going to do a business concentration. Uh, I was going to get an MBA, and then I was going to go into investment banking. I am not an investment banker today. Uh, and then I was going to profit. It was great. Then I met this guy uh, named Randy Pausch while I was there. Uh, so he wrote this book called The Last Lecture, and uh, I believe this is actually the, the 10th anniversary of his last lecture. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Um, but he kind of talked to me and said, like, hey, listen, here's these cool things that you can do. I know you played a lot of video games in the summer. You can make a bunch of video games, too. So I enrolled in this class called Building Virtual Worlds. It was the most grueling class I'd ever taken in my life, and still to this day, probably the hardest I've ever worked. Uh, don't tell my bosses that. Um, and basically, you get paired up with a random team of people, and you have to build an entire virtual reality experience, and this is back in 2001, uh, every two weeks. And I was like, oh my god, I really love this. This is amazing. So then came plan 2.0. So I was going to maybe do some computer science, some human computer interaction. I was going to go to grad school. And I really loved visual effects at the time. And I was going to win an Oscar. And then from there, movies, man, that was a big thing. Let's go profit. So then I got really into shader programming. And I developed a bunch of other VR experiences. This is a crazy one in which we actually made a fake horse that you rode on and bounced on as a VR interface, uh, which led me to Shell Games. And uh, Shell Games at that point was working on an attraction for Disney. So then I was like, yeah, plan uh, 3.0. I was going to go to the grad school. I was going to go to a game company. Uh, games don't really make a lot of money, but I'm at least having a lot of fun. So there you go. And then I met a girl. Uh, and man, that was really awesome. But she moved to LA because she wanted to go work in Imagineering. And she was like, man, you can design theme parks. And I was like, wait, really? I can design theme parks? Uh, so then plan 3.0, graduate. I was going to move to LA, work in theme parks, and then maybe go back to working on games and profit. Uh, but then I got a phone call from a friend that was already working in LA at the time. He's like, dude, you can come down here right now and start working in theme parks. So I packed up all of my stuff and drove to LA in three days. And then came plan 4.0, which was move, graduate, work in theme parks for half a year, and then go back to games, and then maybe profit after that. And then when I was working there, I worked on this uh, attraction called Toy Story Mania, which got to, I got to apply all of my knowledge from shader programming, from my video games, from my experience uh, at school, my, from my experience at previous jobs. I'm like, wow, I really love this. So plan 5.0. Maybe I was going to work in theme parks for two, uh, two years, maybe, and then maybe do something else and keep iterating on a plan. That was 10 years ago. Uh, so that is to say, don't fall in love with a plan. So if I were to leave you right now, it would be with, number one, VR and AR are more than just headsets. Think about them in terms of immersion, and think about them in terms of the addition to the real world. And there's many different ways to go about doing that that aren't just headsets. Number two, we live in the future. Take advantage of it. Don't overthink things, and just do it. And number three, don't fall in love with a plan. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for your insight, Bay. 